Alexis, hello. Hello, Roman. And hello, everyone. Welcome from us as well. Uh, really looking forward to this. I really enjoyed reading Roman's book over the last few weeks. I uh, have many, many questions, um, but I'm also looking forward to your questions later on based on um, how this conversation is going to go. So, Roman, your book in some ways addresses the problem of political imagination. There's this quote in your book, you quote uh, Slavoj Žižek, who famously said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Why do, we, why do you think we suffer from this moment of uh, a lack of political imagination? Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it is that we suffer actually not so much from a lack of political imagination or economic imagination, we have that too, but actually from a lack of temporal imagination. We've got a problem with time. And the last three books I've written have all been an exploration in a sense of our temporal imaginations in different directions. So my last book was called The Good Ancestor, How to Think Long-Term in a Short-Term World, which was kind of about our relationship with the future um, and, and how we imagine or fail to imagine it. I wrote a book before that called Carpe Diem Regain, The Vanishing Art of Seizing the Day, which was about the present moment. And this new book, History for Tomorrow, is about the past. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons why we find it difficult to expand our, or extend our imaginations in that direction towards the past. Certainly, we are embedded in a tyranny of the now, you know, a political presentism, which is structured into political institutions, social media, the next tweet, the next election. And we feel this very much in the UK. Um, but of course, there are deeper forces which have, you know, brought us into the present moment from the, the long history of the tyranny of the clock, going back to the invention of the mechanical clock in the 14th century and the slicing time up into smaller and smaller portions, um, obsessions with technology, which keep us looking to the future, actually more to solutions than to the past. Um, and I think, so I think that's one aspect of it for me. I mean, I think with respect to the Zizek quote, which he allegedly said, right? That's not necessarily, you might know better yeah. than me whether he actually really said that. Um, but I think that also illustrates a kind of, or, or recognizes a poverty of the imagination with respect to economic systems. Like, you know, I, it's, it's so common when we hear about people trying to reinvent capitalism today, people trying to find new words. They're talking about a kind of a capitalism of adjectives there. People are searching for a, a conscious capitalism or a green capitalism or a reinvented capitalism or regenerative capitalism or something. And to me, that's always a sign that the concept's not working. You know, we're moving mm. into another era. It's time to let go. Um, and I think that history actually opens up our imaginations to alternatives. Um, and we may talk about some of this. I talk about you know, alternative economic forms in Japan in the 18th century, you know, for example. So that's kind of how I start thinking about this issue of the imagination, but particularly thinking from that that beginning point of a, of, of a temporal poverty, let's say. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so political imagination, historical imagination kind of uh, feeding into each other. What would you say to someone who said, well, it's not so much that we don't think about history, it's just that sometimes we think of history in the wrong way. So some of us in the West have narratives about why we are where we are and what we're doing here. Usually it involves a sort of linear story of progress. Uh, you know, the Enlightenment plays a big role in that. And so there's a sort of justification of, of where we are now in capitalism to some extent based on history or based on a version of history. So is it that we just aren't thinking of history or is it that we're thinking of history in, in the wrong way? Yeah, it's a good question because of course, many people are thinking about history. You've got the politicians who are uh, manipulating history to keep the refugees out by creating imagined histories of uh, racial purity or um, you know, beautiful colonial times in the past that we need to return to or these kinds of ideas. Um, equally, you have people who are interested in their own personal histories, the rise of genealogical history. People are cert you know, reading magazines about family history and searching to their own family histories. And of course, there are books which are, you know, historians who are starting to write more about learning the lessons of history. Um, Tim Snyder's book on tyranny is an example of that. Um, what, I, what I've found is that for those people who are trying to look to the past, I think there are two kind of um, 
you know, problems worth thinking about. One is well, not necessarily problems, but perspectives which are taken, which are worth thinking about. One is that when people learn from the past, there's a lot of thinking about the warnings of history, looking at what has gone wrong and trying to learn from that. So mm -hmm. Tim Snyder, a brilliant historian, is a good example of that. You know, his work is a lot is about learning from the um, taking lessons from the, the problems of, you know, the, the interwar Europe and the fascism and, and totalitarianism. And of course, I do believe we need to learn from those histories and for, from histories of colonialism, for example. Um, and, or, and, in, and in doing so, bucking the kind of Stephen Pinker-esque enlightenment project of perfect linear histories uh, and so on. Um, but I think that there's not enough looking at the inspiration we can find in the past. And by that, I don't mean, uh, again, going back to someone like Pinker, an idea that history is always getting better. I just mean that there are there have been moments when human beings have managed to organize together uh, to overcome crises and challenges um, that we've often faced things that we've faced before, um, water shortages, climatic changes, wars and uh, um, inequalities and other injustices. And we can learn from those positive lessons. And I think the other thing is when looking at history is, I think there's a very much an everyday tendency to look at the great leaders of history, to look at elites, to try and learn from, there's another biography of Churchill or Napoleon or Nelson Mandela, you know, and of course there's things to learn from that. But I'm very much interested in the old sort of mid 20th century history from below tradition. What can we learn from what we have done together? I'm much more interested in social innovation than technological innovation, let's say. When have we managed to um, band together to collect you know, uh, collective agency really is at the core of what, what interests me, um, because I'm interested in how history can be applied to the present and then kind of used by change makers in society, which could be school teachers, activists, policy makers, anyone who wants to make some kind of difference. And one final thing on this is it is worth recognizing, you know, that there is a, a long intellectual tradition of the idea of applied history, that history is not so much a uh, about a crystal ball helping us predict the future, but it's a a counselor. This goes back to Thucydides, Ibn Khaldun, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Goethe, who said, he who cannot draw on 3000 years is living from hand to mouth. So I'm all for that kind of application uh, of, of history to its possibilities rather than its probabilities. Yeah, and you have a wonderful quote in the book that I think in some way summarizes uh, your thinking about the the past, which is that once we begin to imagine a different history, we can imagine a different future. To what extent do you think this is because we can loosen the the sense that the present is somehow necessary, natural? These the you know, people often talk about capitalism and the free market as sort of almost as having a sort of law-like nature, that this is just human nature, this is how people interact with each other. You know, going against it is going against human nature. And people said obviously things like that about societies that try to organize themselves other, otherwise, um, in particular kind of communist um, countries. So do you think it's an aspect of, of thinking of history as being contingent, being open, of change being more possible? Yeah, absolutely. I think that to, to historicize the present is to denormalize it. And I think what I mean by that is that let's take something like hyper-consumerism of the present world. I sometimes walk through my local shopping center and think there is no way we can stop this juggernaut of consumer capitalism. You just look at people's obsessive addictions to shopping, the pleasures that people get from it, the teenagers that are hanging out in the shopping mall kind of idea. But then, of course, everything has a history, you know, uh, as our consumer addictions have a history. They go. There is a long history of shopping, which I actually talk about in the in the book in, in the second chapter a history which goes back to um, the invention of the public relations industry in the 1920s, figures like Edward Bernays, who got women smoking cigarettes, calling them tortures of freedom, uh, who got people eating bacon and eggs on, on behalf of the meat industry and the pork industry. And then you can trace it further back to the invention of the department store in the 19th century. Um, the idea of creating a kind of emporiums of experience where shopping became a, an all round, all encompassing experience. Um, and I think once you start doing that, you start realizing that actually what we have today, well, it doesn't have to be this way. But as well as tracing those histories, what I think of a kind of a genealogical approach mm -hmm. to 
learning from history. I think then we only need to think about, well, when has it been done in other ways and what can we learn from those? So just on that example, picking this up again in Japan in the 18th century, um, during the Togogawa period, they had what we would today probably call something like a circular economy, an economy where um, everyday materials, resources, cotton, wood, and so on were reused, repurposed, refurbished, recycled. And of course, this isn't an, an aspiration written into EU public policy today, right? But it's something that actually was embedded in Japan in the 18th century. Um, you know, in the city of Tokyo, what used to be called Edo had a, a million people living in it. This is not like a small scale society. This is big scale society. Um, and they managed, they, they partly because Japan was not trading with the outside world at the time, they had these scarcity of things like cotton. So if you had a kimono, you know, you might have a kimono you wore during the day. And when, when, when it wore out, you turn it into pajamas that you'd wear at night. And then after that, you cut it up and turn it into nappies. And then it would turn into floor cloths. And finally, you'd burn that precious cotton for fuel. Right. Um, and so there we have a, a model that we can look to. And in fact, Japanese sustainability scholars today are starting to look more back to that Edo period, um, saying, well, what can we take from that? So I think you need those both those sides to to rethink the present, the sort of the tracing how we got to where we are today, but also looking at alternatives. What do, what do you think? What's your yeah, view? I mean, this is a this this example that you gave um, brings up a question that I, I came to in many of the chapters, which is that obviously, you know, in, in today's kind of context, a lot of people aspire to this sort of, you know, upcycling things or recycling uh, various things, buying something that's much better quality that will last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years rather than changing, you know, a coat every year or, or whatever. Um, but to what extent do you think these are going to be choices that individuals make for themselves and try to adapt their living standards or lifestyle in a way that, you know, is more in tune with some of the things that they aspire to or lessons from the past? And to what extent do you think these can be inspirations for societal change at large, like really changing the whole consumerist uh, structure, changing the way that department stores are run, changing the nature of all the fabric companies and clothing companies and all the rest of it? Do you think, what, what do you think, how do you think of the scale of these changes? Yeah, I certainly don't have much faith in thinking about it at the individual level, about, you know, that we're going to restructure 500 years of capitalist inheritance yeah. um, through making a few lifestyle choices and buying some, you know, green detergent. No. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day with the, the US climate campaigner, Bill McKibben, where he, somebody asked him, you know, what should we do as individuals? He said, well, the, the best thing to do as an individual is to be less of an individual. Um, and I'm pretty much there in the sense that I think we're in an age where we need to shift from individual to collective values. You know, we have a, a long inheritance of inv individualism, which is not just a, a product of um, the economic systems we've inherited, but a lot of the cultural, um, let's say, framing from Sigmund Freud to Oprah Winfrey, you know, in the self-help industry saying that we will change direction through changing ourselves mm -hmm. um no i think absolutely on you know big systemic issues like the ecological devastation of the earth for example um it requires a larger structural solutions um so again look at look at japan okay 18th century again they had a huge shortage of timber they were as dependent on timber as we are today on fossil fuels um they chopped down their trees um they had agriculture, they had famines because of uh, uh, water runoff destroying agriculture. What did they do? Well, one of the things they did is they rationed timber, right? And um, it wasn't always successful, just like rationing in the Second World War wasn't always successful, but it happened. Um, and it raises a question, I think, today. I think this kind of history is a way of opening up a public debate, let's say, about rationing. You know, should we be rationing carbon? Should we be rationing red meat? These things have been going in and out of waves over the last 20 years. I think there's a bit of a resurgence of the rationing discussion around. It's been kind of reframed partly as personal carbon allowances by Thomas Piketty, for example, the French economist, has started talking about rationing. It's quite it's a political no-no. You know, it's a total taboo 
in a, like mm. here we are in an election in Britain. No politician is talking about rationing. Of course not. Right. Mm. Um, but I think these are the discussions we have to have. And the question I guess I ask myself is what are the best ways to open up the what I think of as the ethnosphere. So, you know, we need a, a biosphere is provides, you know, the air that we breathe. The ethnosphere provides the swirl of ideas, worldviews, prejudices, assumptions, and things which shape our views of the world, a kind of Bourdieu style habitus. And I believe we need to be constantly re reconstituting the ethnosphere. <laughs> and um, I think history can help bring in new ideas, new possibilities, more things that are thinkable rather than unthinkable to, to use Bourdieu's terms. Let's talk a little bit though about the, the sort of vehicles of change. So you said, obviously, yeah, we can't rely on individuals just changing their consumption habits or, um, you know, s imposing on themselves uh, limitations on how often they take uh, flights to, to travel abroad and so on. Let's talk about governments, which is where, where most of these changes are going to have to happen. And let's talk about climate change, which is the first chapter of your book. Uh, we all know more or less that our governments are you know, failing to address this problem, at least at any uh, satisfactory rate. And many of us also wonder, well, what else can we really do other than you know, vote for parties that at least acknowledge the problem and maybe offer or suggest some solutions, even if you know those fall quite short? Um, but you look at history and in particular the suffragette movement to find alternatives to sort of propagating change, imposing change on governments. Well, can you tell us a little bit about, about that episode and how you see the parallels between the two historical moments? Yeah, so there's a the way the book is structured that it's, it looks at 10 challenges facing humanity in the 21st century, sort of urgent challenges from the climate crisis and hyper-consumerism to risks of AI, genetic engineering, threats to democracy, migration. So I started with a, the climate crisis as that sort of obvious one that we know that since the alarm bells began to ring in Rio Earth Summit in 1992, well, what has happened to global carbon emissions? They haven't gone down, they've more than doubled, right? And, you know, one might say that, well, look at the Kentucky Coal Museum that now has solar panels on its roof or listen to Al Gore talking about the world on the on the verge of a gigantic renewable revolution but i think we're quite a long way from that mm -hmm. um and so the question is where does one learn from history or what where, where how can history give us an insight into overcoming our fossil fuel addiction and i think one of the key places to look at here is at the history of disruptive social movements to look at when have human societies in the last few centuries undergone radical transformative change. What have been the conditions for that? Um, and so in that chapter, um, I do talk about the suffragettes, but before that I talk about the movement against um, to overturn slavery in British colonies in the Caribbean um, in the early 1830s. And there was a reformist movement at the time, you know, say in 1830, Britain still had nearly three quarters of a million enslaved people working on plantations in the Caribbean, mostly sugar plantations. Um, and there was a reformist movement, but which was very conservative, saying that it would take decades um, to bring about any uh, change to that system. And yet by 1833, there was an Abolition of Slavery Act, which was not perfect by any means. There were reparations paid to uh, slave owners. But why did it happen in 1833? Basically because of a pincer movement of two radical events. One was the great Jamaica slave uprising of 1831, where 20,000, maybe 60,000 enslaved people rose up in defiance against their plantation masters. And the other thing were what were called the Captain Swing Riots in or Rebellion in Britain in around 1830, which was a rural uprising. These two things basically forced the politicians, it scared the politicians really into bringing about change. Um, and... I think we can see a, a similar pattern through history. You see it with the suffragettes. And what, what you actually see is a, a dual pattern, which is sometimes called the radical flank effect. The idea that you may have a mainstream movement for change, um, like the, the mainstream abolitionist movement in Britain in the 1820s. And then what you need to bring about change is a transformative agile change. Is you need a radical flank, a, a sort of a, 
uh, a more radical movement on the side that can almost make the more moderate movement look more reasonable or scare elites into change. And mm. I think that brings us to the present moment where we're seeing that being played out um, with mainstream climate movements, you know, Friends of the Earth or Fridays for Future. And then you've got the radical flank movements, Just Stop Oil, Ender Galender uh, in, in Germany, direct action movements in the US, uh, the old Sunrise movement, these kinds of things. Um, and so I think that's, I think one of the great lessons of history is that disruptive movements can change the system. Mm. And this is something that goes very much against the kind of mainstream narrative about um, movements like Just Stop Oil or uh, Extinction and Rebellion before them and so on, which is exactly the opposite. The claim is that uh, these people are putting people off this cause that they are otherwise sympathetic to. So some people might say, well, you know, uh, most people are sympathetic to the idea that something should be done about climate change, but then they see these radicals and they, you know, they, they yeah. Well, but I think it's really, off. it's it's worth making that point that I think you have to assess a movement as to whether it is having a positive or negative effect. Is it strategically effective? Because mm -hmm. you can have what are sometimes called negative radical flank movements as well as positive ones. So, one of the arguments social movement historians often make is that when um, the African National Congress in the 1950s, um, they saw that there were no peaceful means of change. They formed a guerrilla organization called Spear of the Nation. It was led by Nelson Mandela, right? Uh, who was a guerrilla fighter before he became a peace advocate. Um, and the argument is that, and, and, and Mandela was put in jail for, for those actions. And the, the argument is that the taking that radical, forming a radical flank actually tainted the mainstream um, civil civil rights movement or anti-apartheid movement in Japan and set it back some years. Now, there's a lot of debate around that, but you can ask the same thing of the direct action movements of today. They might be having a negative effect, but actually, as far as I can see from the evidence and the growing body of evidence, even though lots of people disagree with Just Stop Oil throwing orange dye over a Van Gogh painting, actually the media hit they get and the number of people who feel inspired to actually take action not necessarily in the same way but who are open whose minds get open to the issue this changes you know mm. and, and there's a lot of evidence around that especially around extinction rebellion but um uh, but i think so one still has to take tr to track the the evidence base mm. Mm. uh there but yeah i think you're right that it does run against the grain of the the mainstream media the mainstream liberal left media and the right media of course as well and it's also interesting to think back at some of these sort of more radical figures who then get absorbed into mainstream history nelson mandela being one of them emmeline pankhurst from the suffragette movement right uh, go to my kid's school just up the street from here. King. yeah, my, yeah. My, you know who's who's painted on the on the walls yeah, yeah. emmeline pankhurst the suffragettes dandy you know yeah. Um, and, and yet you have a government saying, you know, wanting to put people in prison for doing what those people who are celebrated on the school walls did. I mean, what kind of disjunct is that? What kind of failure to understand how change happens? Or maybe it's an exact recognition of the power of those kinds of movements. One thing that um, gave me or made me feel less sort of hopeless, I guess, in some way, about our current predicament was elements of some of your chapters. And particularly, I'm thinking here about the social media chapter um, that goes against this idea that we're somehow special, right? That sometimes we think when it comes to some of our problems, especially with technology, maybe climate change is also one of them, that it, it's a completely new, unprecedented phenomenon. No one in history has ever faced something similar and you know what are we going to do we don't have the solutions all that sort of stuff and i love the that chapter because you go back at, even to roman times and then obviously the invention of the printing press and you talk about how some of the problems that we have today misinformation fake news clickbait the attention economy all those things had a version you know maybe not quite as on steroids as today but had a, earlier versions of that can you tell us a little bit about diagnosing some of these similarities between our problems today and problems of the past maybe specifically with technology yeah i think when writing a book like this you know when when you look at these issues in, in today's world 
like AI or social media and democracy and so on. And you try and think, well, how does one think historically about these? Because that's what I'm trying to do, right? To ask that question. How does one think historically about these issues? You might think, well, social media, it's also modern. It's also new. Um, but of course, once you start ferreting around in the past and and using the power of analogy, um, then you can things start opening out. So uh, I just happen to have actually on my desk this book by Elizabeth Eisenstein called The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe, right, which is a classic uh, historical analysis of the effects of the print revolution in the 15th, 16th century. Um, and one of the things you find there was that, of course, printing created these huge social polarizations because it enabled um, Protestant reformists to have a voice. So when Martin Luther published his 95 theses critiquing the Catholic Church in 1517, well, his theses were immediately published on the new printing presses, uh, which had been emerging in, in Germany over previous decades. In the 1520s, of the roughly six million pamphlets which were printed, one third were by Luther. And so it enabled a dissenting minority voice um, or position to be able to challenge papal authority. And as Eisenstein points out, was that um, the, the religious wars of the 17th and 18th century, which killed tens of millions of people, partly were, let's say, accelerated by mm. the printing press. And so when I watch a film today like The Social Dilemma, um, you know, where you hear these tech um, uh, entrepreneurs saying, well, hey, social media, we thought it was going to connect everybody and uh, we had no idea it was going to create polarizations or lead to the capital attack on Washington or, uh, or the Proud Boys and QAnon. I think to myself, well, I'd like to give a copy of this book to all those tech entrepreneurs, right? Maybe that it wouldn't have made much difference, you know, but... I think there's a story there in in the past again, which says that yeah, we've as you say, you know, we've been here before, um, and maybe it is on steroids today, and I think that that's true. Um, that 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 the you know we've always had communications technology since we invented writing. Then comes the printing press, and 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 then but now then it gets kind of accelerated through time. So I think we can look at the history of social media for diagnosing the problems of today to some extent but i think we can also find interesting solutions and just very briefly on that you know the the printing press did create polarizations it did allow clickbait like a all the um pamphlets written um about supposed witches in germany in the 16th century that led to tens of thousands of them being um, burnt at the stake and it was a, it was a commercial exploit to spread those kinds of stories about witchery and devils yeah that, um, that stuff was fascinating to read i had no i had no clue about all that but yeah it's it's a very interesting detail of your of your chapter on this well to be honest i didn't have a clue about that either you know i i knew about that about 500 witches been burnt in, in in england uh in in the 16th 17th century but then in germany um there's this huge you know phenomenon Mm -hmm. um that was a real that was early fake news that was early clickbait um but then of course the printing press um just to give a, a small nod to stephen pinker um, <laughs> which i don't often do um you know did bring about uh, a questioning of superstitions through the spread of sort of rational scientific ideas it did start questioning uh the idea of witchcraft um and it did contribute to what Jürgen Habermas, you know, the great German philosopher, called the, the invention of the public sphere. The idea that there was a, a space developing in society in the 18th century, partly created by print culture, partly created by the coffee houses of London and, and Vienna and so on, where people could have conversations about republicanism, about anti-slavery, um, questioning the status quo. And I think that partly came out of that technology too. So that, again, should make us think about um, how do we amplify those those aspects of cre of of resuscitating a public sphere, um, which in fact in a, in a way is what we're trying to do here now, right? Um, it's not quite like the the coffee houses of the 18th century, but there right now I'm looking at the webinar chat, I'm looking at the Q and A. There's all these questions coming in. There are there's an exchange going on, and I'd like to get to those questions. So let me ask you um, maybe my final question which was something that, you know, in many ways, as I said, I, 
I found aspects of uh, these stories from from the past very appealing and sometimes making me feel less kind of despairing about um, the present and seeing how things were done differently, even, you know, not in the too distant past sometimes. But there was a sort of lagging question that I had in the back of my book, um, back in my mind. And of course, you end up addressing it towards the end of your book. And you say that this book does not provide lessons or formulas for the future. There are no iron laws of history. There are no fixed patterns that cross boundaries of geography and time, end quote. So that was what I was thinking. I was thinking that was then, this is now different context, different constraints, different problems, different circumstances in some ways. We are unique, you know, in some ways we're not unique because people have faced similar problems, but in other ways, this is a unique moment in time and there hasn't been one like it. Uh, the institutions we have are different. The kind of constraints that people might have are different. So if that is true, and today we do find ourselves in these different geography circumstances, how can we use the this, this stories, these stories of the past, um, to help us with dealing with our present. Yeah, so it's true that I do say that there are no iron laws of history. You know, nothing in history is inevitable until it happens. I absolutely believe in that form of contingency. But it doesn't mean I believe that there are no patterns. It's just that the patterns don't hold through space and time. They are not iron laws. Um, and, you know, there are a hundred examples one could think of. I mean, in the book, I discuss, for example, the work of the um, political economist um, Ellen Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, um, and her idea, her work on the commons, and the idea that she looked historically, not only historically, partly historically, at are there any patterns about showing that human beings have a capacity in their communities to manage resources um, and deal with problems of scarcity. And of course, she comes up with lots of examples. In fact, I draw on one of those in my book. I talk about something called the Tribunal of Waters in Valencia, which still exists today. It's a water court where every week, every Thursday at noon, outside the west door of the cathedral in Valencia, there's a group of eight democratically embedded, uh, elected members of the local irrigation canals. That's where we get our Valencia oranges from. And they self-manage democratically the waters that they have and they hold these little public hearings now that's something that has survived for hundreds of years that's history still alive now and that example was very dear to ellen ostrom because it was one of the uh, examples which helped to develop a, a set of principles for what allow a commons to operate successfully she said they need to be shared rules they need to be um, punishments for those who break the rules so we can see those patterns or just to give you another example linked to the um disruptive social movements in the towards the end of the book i talk about this idea of a, a disruption nexus um and uh, it's a sort of a triangular kind of diagram uh, and and the three corners of the triangle are crisis movements and ideas and what that triangle is trying to say is that through the last couple of years of couple of hundred years of history if we're looking for moments of change when have they happened They've happened when there's been some kind of crisis, ecological, technological, financial. Um, but that by itself isn't enough normally. I mean, governments are very good at ignoring uh, crises. They have to be combined with new visionary ideas and they have to be combined with disruptive movements that bring about change. And you can have some parts of that and not others. So let's say the 2008 financial crash that was a financial crisis you had a disruptive movement to bring about change the occupy movement but i don't think we had the visionary economic models yet embedded enough in the ethnosphere uh like degrowth or donor economics well-being economics modern monetary theory and so on i think it'd be a bit different today but we didn't have all corners of the triangle so that's a a pattern that pattern does not hold in the 16th century before the nation state right right it holds in the era when disruptive social movements had targets of power. Mm. Right? So that's what I would kind of say to that, that one's looking for patterning rather than laws. One's looking for similarities as much as difference. Um, let's We're looking for moments of radical hope that yes, we have overcome uh, challenges, which maybe don't exactly mirror well, where we are today, but they still speak from the past to who we are and who we might be.
Uh, okay, I have many follow up questions, but I'd like to get to the audience, uh, the audience's questions as well. I'll I'll summarize them some so to keep it short. So the first question is about liberalism and whether it's failed to inspire collective action. Um, what do you what do you believe? How can we inspire collective action in an individualistic age? Nah. So one of the ways I think about this is the relationship between introspection and what I think of as outrospection. In other words, the the inheritance of, of the last century, as I mentioned earlier, I think is um, a kind of hyper individualism, partly coming out of neoliberalism, partly coming out of 19th century, 19th century liberal ideas, John Stuart Mill and so on, and partly out of self-help culture, therapy, industry, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, we are engaged at this moment in, I think, a time of flux towards um, a resurgence of collective values. And I think of the, the struggle as one as outrospection. In other words, to discover who we are and how to live by stepping outside ourselves. Sort of, you are, therefore I am, rather than maybe I think, therefore I am, or I shop, therefore I am. Um, how much progress are we making? Well, that is a really difficult one. I remember reading this book on uh, the history of uh, the industrial uh, industrial energy by, um, what was his name? Uh, Tony Wrigley, the great demographer. And there was this sentence I read in it where he said that, you know, when Adam Smith was writing in the 18th century, he didn't even realize there was an industrial revolution going on, yet he was right in the middle of it. Um, and so, of course, it is very difficult to see where we are today. Um, but just to give one practical example. So you might know the, the model of uh, the donut economy, which is the idea of that we need to shift to a post-growth economy, which is within planetary boundaries, but bringing people above a basic basic social foundation, um, who developed by the economist uh, Kate Rayworth. Disclaimer, she is my partner. Um, but the thing about donut <laughs> economics um, is that it's being put into practice in over 100, 100 cities around the world, as well as in communities and, and other, other, other areas. And when I look at those examples, which are kind of about a regenerative economy, much more based on collective ideals, um, I think post-liberal in, in many fundamental ways, I see a kind of hope there that when you join the dots uh, between those kinds of examples, um, I see something happening. I mean, just a few days ago, we had a visitor to our, to our home, uh, a, a brilliant uh, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian indigenous uh, scholar called Kamana Bima, who's developed the idea of the ancestral circular economy. Um, and this is the idea that in native Hawaiian culture, they've always had a circular economy. So you might go back to Edo, you could go back mm. to Hawaii, right? Um, the fact that those ideas are starting to come into the public sphere, I think is exciting. And it's, I think it's questioning the um, obsessive introspective individualism that we need to move beyond, or at least get into better balance with. Yeah. Well, what's your view on that? Um, and thank, a really good thinking, question, by the way. A really good yeah, question. I was thinking about how the pandemic was a kind of missed opportunity of, of realizing this sort of uh, poverty of individualism and recognizing the kind of interconnectedness of everything and how what happens in one corner of the globe, um, you know, can change th people's lives in another corner of the globe. And you would have thought that maybe that could have been a, a sort of spark of thinking more collectively um which i haven't really seen realized i think people want to put the pandemic behind them and not really think about it very much um so i don't know i i feel i feel like these these cultures of individualism are gonna are gonna be really difficult to to untangle and i wonder to what extent to, to get to the second question from the audience to what extent the stories we tell ourselves are all linked to to individualism. So, to what extent do you think individualism is linked to, say, the the story of um, the Enlightenment? So this uh, T Tom Motti asks, you know, to what extent do you dispute the Steven Pinker view of progress of society over time uh, as he presents it in Enlightenment now? And do you think that it's just too simplistic a, a portrayal of history, or do you do you fundamentally disagree with it? Yeah. So I think. Yeah, very important question. Um, I think individualism, I don't think it's always been bad, right? And and for that, 
kind of perspective, I'd go back to the Renaissance when individualism as it emerged in Renaissance European culture, I think was partly a rejection of feudalism, right? It was a rejection of um, being slotted into a social structure. You're a peasant, you're a craftsperson, you're this, you're that. And um, the Renaissance humanists, I think, uh, were, were celebrating an individualism that was trying to break the role play uh, inherited from feudal structures. Um, but then moving on to the Enlightenment, and then of course, individualism started changing, you know, and started becoming linked to the idea of self-interest um, rather than uniqueness, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, the story of the Enlightenment, uh, so-called progress since the 18th century. Um, when it comes to Stephen Pinker, you know, I do read Pinker's books. I, I make myself read them, though I find them absolutely infuriating, mostly. Um, why? Well, you know, my children, when they were four years old, knew that you couldn't keep blowing up a balloon without the prospect that it was going to pop. I don't feel that Stephen Pinker understood this. Um, you know, that the, the language in books like Enlightenment Now about progress, about growth, about technology and and so on that you know is he i can't remember the exact quote but he basically he quotes the 19th the 19th century historian macaulay saying look if it's happened in the past there's no reason why it shouldn't happen in the future well i think that shows that kind of linearity shows a fundamental failure to understand systems thinking dynamics the idea of tipping points um for example the idea of loops that the things come and go uh things can collapse fast um, and even when they grow slow. Um, and I think more specifically, I see a lot of manipulation in his work. Uh, look at the chapters on the environmental issues in Enlightenment now, where he has cherry picked um, graphs and, and data which show improving envi environmental um, prospects. Like I think one of them is about the expanding um, amount of land uh, which has been dedicated to national parks or something like that. Right. Um, I think that's shocking to put that and yet not put the put in his amongst his 75 or 76 graphs. I think they're on that in that book, uh, the enormous amount of data about um, biodiversity loss, about climate emissions and uh, ocean acidification, land degradation, all the planetary boundaries that Rockstrom and Stefan looked at. I think it's really quite shocking. Um, so there's a in, in that sense, Pinker, who is an apostle of reason, is very unreasonable. Uh, on, on the level of not really sticking to his uh, methodology of drawing on the empirical evidence. Looking at the data, yeah. Looking at the data as the great enlightenment uh, tradition uh, yeah. s says. Um, someone has just noted in the chat, Pinker's excellent demonstration of Maya. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not quite sure what that refers to there. Let's leave the chat to, leave that to chat. fill up on its own and, and focus on some. Oh, in my humble, yeah, the demonstration in Maya. Okay. Anyway, let's let's leave that. So someone uh, is saying that they've become they've become a little bit cynical over the years, and the cynicism is leading them to shrinking of an imagination. They struggle to imagine a world transforming radically for the better, and the future feels threatening, overwhelming. And they ask, is there a sort of self-help or self-care element to your book that might help people that have become cynical? Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a self-help. I'd call it, a, let's just say, a we help uh, element to it. I do think that um, when you start looking at these moments in the past where we've, you know, created a circular economy in 18th century Japan or movements have risen up to disrupt systems, um, and the many other examples, my book, moments of in, in southern Spain in the uh, 11th, 12th century, when Jews, Muslims and Christians manage a certain kind of tolerant living together. I think that gives hope. I think that gives a sense of, you know, what I think of as radical hope as opposed to optimism, not a glass half full. Everything's going to be fine. I don't believe that. I don't think everything's going to be fine. I think we are on a pathway of ecological self termination. I think we have introduced technological risks which are potentially devastating. But I think, you know, radical, the word radical comes from the word root. I think sort of at its root, um, human beings have a capacity for collective action to bring about change. 
Um, and I see that repeated throughout history. And if I can just pick up another question I just saw from Leslie in the Q&A, where, because it links to this, she said, can you comment on the over 2,500 lawsuits underway globally related to the climate crisis? Aren't they more promising than movements like Extinction Rebellion? Um, I'm a great believer. And in fact, I never used to be such a believer in the law as a, as a form of change. I used to think that law was um, really about inertia, um, something that tried to embody and maintain systems of power. But actually, there have been incredibly important climate lawsuits, uh, as Leslie mentioned there. There's the Our Children's Trust lawsuits in the United States and Montana and on the federal level, the Juliana case. There's been the um, lawsuits in the Netherlands against Shell uh, lawsuits in the UK as well. But are they more important than something like Extinction Rebellion? Well, actually, I think these work together beautifully. I think what the direct action movements do is they are creating space and the public conversation where looking at the lawsuits looks like a great thing to do. It doesn't look so crazy and doesn't look so radical. You're finding judges basically because of the new public conversation having to take cases, listen to cases which they otherwise maybe wouldn't have if there hadn't been this shift in the public conversation. So I really don't think those two things are separate. I think if you took away the um, environmental movements from the 1960s to the present, I don't think we'd have any really effective climate lawsuits. Um, and in fact, I think you find organizations like in the UK, Client Earth are supportive of the more radical direct action movements. Um, and of course, some of the, the radical movements are bringing climate lawsuits themselves because their protesters are being jailed and are not even in the UK even able to use the defense that I'm trying to save planet Earth because it's procedurally not correct in a court of law. That's pretty mad. That's nuts. Um, I'm going to tag a question to the next question that I that I also had. The, the next questioner is, says, how do we get those in power to see the long-term benefits, including financial benefits, uh, to deal with climate change. Some people often not, you know, I think it was a Stern report um, that came, I don't know, many, many years ago now. 2006. Yeah, yeah. which was essentially arguing that there was 20 years nearly ago, arguing that there was a, a clear economic case for um, dealing with the environmental crisis. I just want to ask along alongside this, where do you stand in relation to the sort of other philosophical movement that um, some of some representatives of who are also at Oxford, Will McCaskill, for example, so-called long-termist thinking that um, are also trying to think in a different time scale, trying to think about the very, very distant future. Where do you see, how do you see your your work connected to that? And, and how do we get governments more interested in long-term problems? Yeah, why don't we start with the second one, just for fun. Um, so, I have very strong disagreements with the effect of altruism, long-termist perspective on uh, future thinking. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, the work of Will McCaskill, Toby Ord and others, I read it, I find it engaging. Uh, some of them live down the street from me. Um, it's a really big uh, subject. Um, where, I'm, where I think our, 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 where we meet is that I too am interested in how do we expand our ethical circle towards future generations. Um, I believe we've colonized the future. We treat it as a dumping ground for ecological degradation and technological risk, as if there's nobody there. And yet there are all the populations of the future there who have no voice, no rights. Um, I think the effect of altruism movement and, and the, its sort of long-termism spin-off, um, where I part ways uh, in, in many areas. First, I think there is, in that particular movement, um, is a bias towards technological risks and not putting sufficient emphasis on ecological risks. Mm -hmm. I think that's very clear in, look at page 167 of Toby Ord's book, um, The Precipice, and you'll see a table that says there's a one in 10 chance AI will wipe us out by the end of the, the century, but about a one in 1000 chance that um, climate change will. Um, and I think that tells you something about that sense of priorities. And I think that's highly problematic because if your theory doesn't enable a way of thinking about the problem that by 2050, maybe 100 million people in Bangladesh might die due to climate risk. Uh, and if you're only thinking about the low probability, but high impact AI events 200 years from now, I think there's a problem with your moral theory, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of one way of critiquing it. Um, I think another thing is that I think you find in this literature, a 
big pink pinkeresque kind of bias towards the growth will sort out our problems technology will sort out our problems um we don't need to change political structures or political institutions in any way um we can use markets we can use technology and i think that is very narrow um i think that's a very ineffective form of altruism or a very limited one um mm -hmm. so i won't go on too much about that but I, that's my my general approach uh, i could say more about that but i am as i said ineffective altruism is a pretty devastating tagline yeah yeah um i think it's rather ineffective um though you know i think they've done some good work raising certain issues like biosecurity um bringing them slightly more into the public discussion and i think that's not a bad thing um and uh but and then how do you get those in power to engage with the long term um that's a tricky issue i've spent many years <laughs> engaged with this i think going back to how we started the conversation look you can you can try and do what nicholas stern did um and tweak discount rates and things like that um you know tweak taxes um but i think we need to go for the big levers of change the big levers of change are changing the imagination uh, uh, as you're suggesting they're changing how we think about time um they're changing the metaphors and language so i talk about the idea of being a good ancestor um as a way of trying to expand our ethical vision in the future i talk about the idea of colonizing the future to try and create a new public discussion about our relationship with the citizens of tomorrow the future sisters let's say rather than the ancestors um you know of course there are public policies that might be linked to that so to promote regenerative economic models to promote the steward ownership look at a company like patagonia who've shifted their ownership model to basically where the earth is their one shareholder they're now steward owned or steward run in effect um promoting those kinds of models i think those and they're not the kind of things you'd find the effect of altruists talking about i don't think and i don't want to be too offensive i do engage in the issues i just i just think there's a kind of you know utilitarian philosophy uh out of which the effect of altruism movement comes i think is can be highly attractive but it is only one perspective out of several thousand years of thinking about ideas in in the history of western and non-western thought so let's not put all eggs in one basket <laughs> i don't know where are you where are you on that alexis um, I think what you said sounds quite sensible. Um, I also don't really know how you can end up, um, influencing governments at that level. I do think sometimes you need to make maybe more technocratic, um, arguments around, for example, the efficiency of, uh, of these measures. Um, I'm now editing a piece that says, you know, forget, forget about the environment, like the economy needs a climate change kind of economy. Uh, you know, it's going to be good for jobs, it's going to be um, good for people's finances. So trying to use arguments that tap into people's other needs and, and sensitivities and not necessarily just their moral sensitivities about um, the environment, climate change and the future, I think probably has to be part of the recipe of, of uh, bringing about change. Should we end with a question about philosophy? So let's end with a question about, about history. Philosophy. This is the philosopher, yeah. After all, magazine. Um, the ph philosophy is often thought about as teaching people to think openly, think about uh, alternatives. You, you mentioned genealogical thinking, Nietzsche's um, philosophy is very much in that vein, trying to tell a story about the past and how we came to where we are. So Trevor asks, what are your thoughts about the fact that philosophy as the domain that deals with these questions isn't really taught in school and also doesn't really hold much power, uh, influence or domestically or internationally? You know, philosophers aren't often invited, I imagine, to the World Economic Forum to put forward their, their alternative. So what do we make of this? And is that going to have to be part of um, changing things? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I'm a big believer in the teaching of philosophy in school um for example um both my children who are 15 are thinking of doing philosophy a level or philosophy in the last couple of years of of high school i think they're going to be disappointed um because i think the the kind of philosophical questions and approaches coming up are probably heavily analytical um less on the sort of continental side let's say and i think one needs a bit of 
balance there. Um, and I, you know, I think that, you know, movements like uh, philosophy for children and stuff have done a lot of good work. Um, I think they, they often, they, I think often these philosophical education projects are a little bit too rationalist for me, for my liking. I think they need more on, um, values on empathy on emotional intelligence sort of woven into it um and you know i remember when i studied philosophy as an undergraduate i didn't study any psychology or any neuroscience for that matter or any history when i was answering the philosophical questions of you know the trolley problem <laughs> which way should the trolley go um and you know i've always just be been a big believer that uh, in in looking at history because to answer any philosophical question, I always ask myself, well, what have we done in the past? How, what are humans capable of? In fact, we're not that much different as people from the ancient Greeks or <laughs> so on. We have a lot of the same fears. Uh, we have a lot of the same desires. Um, I mean, in that sense, I think philosophy is still absolutely relevant to the questions that we have uh, today. And so you can read Thucydides, um, you can read Aristotle's politics uh, and ethics and ask yourself, about the, the 10 big questions that I'm looking at in my book. Um, but, you know, this is not a book of philosophy. Um, it's philosophical in the, in the deep sense of, I believe in the power of ideas to change society, not just the power of economic systems, political systems to shape our minds, right? And the idea here is about a kind of temporal intelligence that in order to go forwards, we need to look backwards. We need to extend our minds into the past and, escape the tyranny of the now.